Welcome, I'm Ellen with Earth Talk. You can hear the whistle in the background. Back in 1939, there were inventors and soybeans and hemp fabric and electric cars and victory gardens. That's back when Charlie Davis Jr. was just entering kindergarten. Welcome to Earth Talk. Thank you. And he's going to take us through the village today to see beautiful Model T vehicles and understand that the innovation is happening now as well as then. Experimental lab. Was this here when you were going to school? Charlie? Yes, it was. Henry, Henry Ford used soybeans to make more than just food. He designed Model A car parts, an experimental car body, and suit of clothes from the plant. So what, let's take a look at Ryan and he'll tell us what do you know about soybeans? They actually made a car out of soybeans, from what I was told. Is that right? That's correct. When Henry Ford uh, bought the Wayside Inn in Sudbury, Massachusetts back in the early 20s, uh, he hired a man by the name of uh, Boyer and uh, to be the manager there. And Mr. Boyer had a son by the name of Robert Boyer who uh, was of college age. And so uh, Henry Ford was a, quite a, a, a good uh, discover of, of he loved youth he found the spark of creativity and innovation in everyone yeah, that's right and so, fanned it to life so he invited uh, this Robert Boyer to uh, forego his plans to go to Andover a prep school and then on to Dartmouth and come to the Edison Institute of Technology Wow and upon his graduation he became the um, he experimented with uh, soybeans for Henry Ford and, and uh, in later life went on to get some real important patents. They, uh, as you mentioned, they, uh, they made a car out of soybeans and he also uh, uh, made uh, fabric. And, and he loved cooking with soybeans, or he hired chefs that knew how to cook. That's correct. But Robert Boyer was more interested in the industrial applications of the soybeans. Okay. Uh, he was uh, he also had another boyhood chum by the name of Edsel Ruddeman. And Edsel Ruddeman and he uh, uh, remained friends their whole lives. And he, he went on to do the experimental work on soybeans for the nutritional Parts. So, we've just heard how Charlie's lineage links. The Ruddeman and the Ford families have been very close. And your great-great-grandmother was... She was Mary Ann Ruddeman. She was Edsel Ruddeman's sister. And, uh, and Henry named his son Edsel that, after this good childhood friend of his. That's correct. Yeah. So it was through that friendship that you're going to be able to share some really nifty stories with us today. <laughs> so we're going to be looking at Charlie's, a snapshot into his mind, where he was the gift recipient at the Edsel and Eleanor Christmas Eve events. <laughs> Woo! But first, let's go inside, and we'll take a peek at the soybeans. This is a... Uh, Okay. An extractor uh, for the soybeans where they extracted the oil. And uh, this was done by Robert Boyer. In fact, in that picture, you can see uh, the car that he, uh, he built. The, this all the, the body parts. It wasn't the frame or the engine or the tires. So no rubber, no metal, but everything else, fabric, body, was all designed from soybeans. Right. And it's a beauty. I would have been proud to have driven it. And this Henry Ford used as an advertisement 
the trunk on this car. This is a regular uh, standard car, but he had a trunk made out of the soybeans and he hit it with an axe. <laughs> and it bounced back into shape. It was the Douglas bumper. So we've got a gorgeous lab here, just filled with an innovator's mind. And well, he made a lot of patent money on these through the years, didn't well, he? Well, this Robert Boyer, yes. Yeah. But the building now is basically just agricultural uh, tools or implements that uh, have to do with farming. Right, and, okay. the, and the soybeans. It's a beautiful place. You can see some of the harnesses for the plow horses right. that tilled the fields, and there they planted the soybeans. Right. And it was a rich history. And um, from what I understand, Henry um, loved an Orient um, chef, and he brought him in, and for the World's Fair, they said he prepared all kinds of delicacies. Well, actually, uh, this chef was from the Netherlands. Oh, the Netherlands. And uh, his name was Jan Willems, and he lived to be 100 years old. He just died a, a year or two ago. Did you ever meet him? Oh, his son and I, his son was in my class, and his brother was in my brother's class. Wow. So, yes, we knew him well, and... And uh, did you ever eat any of his soybean creations? I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it was kind of a fad. But no, they, it really Henry Ford really felt that, and they still do use soy products. Tofu was one of the big one. Yes, and uh, the, a lot of that was developed by Robert Boyer. Mm -hmm. And and one of the most profound uses of soy is it's not relying on animals for protein. Right. And it's freeing up the the it, it's a lot more affordable in terms of the agricultural system to have a plant-based diet providing right. protein because you're not using up to 15 times as much water and um, grain to feed, you know, pound of beef. Well, during the war, uh, the meat and a lot of the regular food products were rationed. And so Henry Ford felt that it would be a good thing to be able to provide things made out of soy, and which he did. Okay. And uh, there were, there, I recall there was a, a Del Soy topping company in Dearborn that had a, a great big, looked like a big aerosol can. And uh, it, it, that is not there anymore, but they still make this, uh, Topping, and it's sold commercially, or you can get it in the grocery store. Our cameraman Ryan and I were noticing in the beautiful book that your friend wrote about your schoolhood days that there was a recipe for model T crackers made out of soy products. Right, and interestingly, <laughs> you might ask why they were called model T's. It was because uh, the chef, after he rolled the dough out, he used a Model T hubcap to cut them out. Oh, how interesting. <laughs> Cute little rounds. Right. How innovative. So I promised our viewers that you'd tell us just a smidge about collecting gifts at Christmas Eve. <laughs> well, when I was real little, I would say six or seven years old, uh, Edsel Ford had a, uh, uh, Edsel Rudderman had a, a son by the name of Stanley Rudderman. And Stanley and Camille would have a Christmas party every year, and they would invite the the Fords, and they would my parents and uh, my aunt Margaret and Catherine Rudderman. And uh, so one year when I uh, we went to the party, it was my job to go up and drop uh, gifts that everybody was supposed to bring, and so uh, and drop them into. They had a big stocking. Uh, it was a big circular uh, staircase and and so I'd go up the stairs and drop the presents in and so I made sure I remembered what Clara Ford got and I made sure my mother got it which turned out to be a bottle of smelling salts. <laughs> or when she swooned, huh? <laughs> but my gift was a uh, little keychain that was a horse stirrup and I gave it to Henry Ford and Henry Ford opened the gift and he said, who gave me this gift? And I stuck out my chest. I did, Mr. Ford. He said, don't you know I've been trying to put horses out of business all these years and you give me something like that? <laughs> How did you feel then? Not oh, as proud. I no, it didn't bother me. Oh, I, I, I knew he was just jesting. 
because he was a friend of yours, and he could he could tease you a bit. You knew him <laughs> for many days. Well, he used to come to chapel almost every day. So maybe we should head that way, and you can show us what we're going to be seeing next. Any last word about the soybean? No, not really. But it's rich in terms of its history, and soybeans are a backbone of what we do now. Yeah. Let's go search for that school. All right. Thank you very much. So Charlie, we're in front of a cornfield, and I understand that you were encouraged as an Edison Institute student to grow things. That's correct. We were each given a, a garden plot that was down closer to uh, Southfield Road, and uh, we were we raised anything we wanted to, uh, and they provided everything, the seeds and all this. And uh, in the end, you it was a double. Uh, thing because you could not only utilize the the uh, produce you produced, you could also sell it in a little uh, stand that they had at, at the uh, entrance to the village road. And I understand Henry Ford himself would bring the proceeds that you guys had earned at Christmas time so that you understood enterprise right. as well as agriculture. Right. And I like to notice that these are authentic corn stalks. They're not GMO. They're not jammed in together so close that nothing can get in and weed between them. And it's something that if I were to sink my teeth into it, it would be sweet corn and it would be delicious. It wouldn't break a tooth. <laughs> so it's lovely to see the real thing. Down the road we go. Well, well, hello, welcome to the Ford birthplace. I'm Cindy. Hi, Cindy. Uh, Introduce I, I'm Charlie Davis. Hi. Nice to meet you. Well, hi, Mr. Davis. And my mother's grandmother's name was, was Mary Ann Rudiman. And she, uh, her uh, brother James Rudiman married uh, Margaret Ford, Henry oh. Ford's sister. And we know her. We know her stories. We get to tell her stories. Why don't you tell a little bit about it? Well, we have a book in our in our dining room, and it has the it is the history of the family, and it has pictures of all the Ford relatives, and one beautiful picture of Margaret Rudiman when she was a young girl. Very nice. We. And this is Henry's home. And this is the Henry Ford birthplace. He was born here in July of 1863. He was one of six children born here. Wow. And of course, his best buddy was a Rudiman too, you know, Edsel. Edsel, right. Yeah, you know that name. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up with Aunt Margaret and Catherine. It was interesting because anytime I, she, uh, Catherine Rudiman was the exact same age as my mother and they both, oh, okay. they played together as little kids and, and they remained friends their whole life. They both oh, died how wonderful. a month mm -hmm. apart at age 90. Oh, oh my wow. goodness. And Catherine, anytime my mother moves, or anytime my parents moves any place, Henry Ford built a house for Aunt Margaret and Catherine so they could be close by. Oh, he, they were very kind to, to get your aunt, your aunt and yes, her, your cousin. Yes. I yes. remember when I was little, we couldn't even go down and see what Santa Claus brought until Auntie and Cotty got there. <laughs> <laughs> How cute! She was probably remembering her the early days when she said the younger children had to get up before their big brother Henry, or he got the um, mechanical toys apart before they got to play with them. <laughs> that probably is where that habit started. <laughs> well, Aunt Margaret uh, really did, even though she was younger, did kind of hold the household together. So Henry was a young man that was very, very skilled at getting other young men to kind of go along with some of his schemes. And one of the things that he liked to do was tinker. So one day at school at recess, he decided that he was going to build a water wheel in one of the local little creeks. And he got some young men to, to go along and help him out with that. And they built this water wheel and it actually worked. And they were very excited about that. But then the recess bell rang and it was time to go back to class. Well, they left it there. <laughs> and unfortunately, it ceased to work. And it flooded one of the local farmer's fields. And they weren't allowed to tinker at recess anymore. 
Wasn't didn't they used to have that in front of the Miller School? Mm -hmm. I remember it was there yes. when I, I went to school. Yes, there. they did. <laughs> oh, you went to school here? Yes, <gasps> I went. I started in kindergarten, and I was in the last graduating class. 1953. 52. 52. Okay, mm -hmm. very good. And that was. The, I have been told stories about how Henry. This was your school, the student school, and they students pretty much had the run of the place. Oh, yes. But you had classes in deportment and how to behave. <laughs> That's right. I love it. <laughs> we, every Friday, we used to uh, have a day, square dance up in, in Lovett Hall, and we had to get kind of gussied up, and we, Benjamin Lovett called, and, and we had a five-piece live orchestra. So, I think that we should return to those days. I think today's <laughs> child needs to go in the school week in the ballroom with, with social skills. Wouldn't that be lovely? Yes. And fun, too. I think so. <laughs> and fun, too. Oh, I, we could sit and talk for hours. We certainly could. Ooh. In 1933, or it was actually 34, or 33 and 34, the, in the Chicago World's Fair, that was when they built the rotunda right. for the mm -hmm. World's Fair. And Henry Ford moved this barn, which was his father's barn, and uh, to Chicago. And uh, he planted soybeans around it. And they, uh, his uh, chef it was Jan Willems. Uh, he planned a whole meal made out of soybeans. That was looked frowned upon by, uh, by some of the news people. <laughs> But uh, they did it. <laughs> it's like the weed sandwiches that he and George Washington Carver served at the well, meeting I, that I they had. Well, I can tell you a funny story about that. Uh, Henry Ford's chauffeur, uh, Rufus Wilson, uh, invited, uh, he had a son by the name of Dick Wilson, who was in my brother's class, and he invited the boys to go out and take a tour of the bomber plant and in Willow Run. So, on the way out, he turned around and said, have you boys had lunch yet? And they said no, and so he passed them a bag, and it was full of dandelion sandwiches. And when he wasn't looking, they pitched it out the window. And <laughs> Henry Ford saw it. <laughs> and he said to Rufus Wilson, he said, I don't think the boys liked their lunch. <laughs> oh, no! Class. All right. Thank you oh, so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Davis. That was fun swapping can stories we, with you. Can we steal it? Charlie, on our way to school, we're just passing the Wright Cycle Company. Do you know anything about Orville and Wilbur Wright? Well, Orville and Wilbur Wright. Uh, built the first airplane and uh, Henry Ford was very interested in air airplanes and he actually built airplanes. He built the Ford Trimotor which was some of them are still in existence. Wow. And he was a he was involved in so many things that it's hard to believe. But the one biggest I would say this one biggest thing was education. Charlie, I know that Kitty Hawk was where they had the first flight in North Carolina. And I can see down the, down the road there the uh, Martha and Mary Chapel where I remember reading a book that Henry brought Orville Wright up to the pulpit and he talked about that first flight one day during church. Really? Yep. That must have been pretty nifty. Yes, we had some very interesting people that spoke in in uh, our chapel service, we had uh, Charles Lindbergh and uh, Walt Disney and uh, uh, Mickey Rooney and, and uh, quite a few celebrities. And the King and Queen of England. You'll have to tell us that story in a minute. <laughs> okay. Let's get going. carousel and I can see the kids playing stickball back there in front of the Martha Mary Chapel. This is a good spot for you to tell that story about the King and Queen of England I think. In 1939 Henry Ford 
uh, had all the fifth and sixth grade boys go to the New York World's Fair. And uh, he sent them in groups of eight, and they stayed for two months. And Henry Ford rented a big mansion at Great Neck, Long Island for these boys to live in. Not too shabby. No, I guess not. They had amenities, which I'm sure not any of them had in later life, with chauffeurs and butlers and whatnot. That uh, chauffeurs would take them around the sites in New York City. Well, uh, they sent teachers along also, and they sent trainers, which were upperclassmen. And one time, uh, these boys, Henry Ford, had a, min a miniature made of the Menlo Park uh, machine shop, which is right over there. And the boys worked in there and made souvenirs to pass out at the fair. And so one day, John L. Lewis came up to the exhibit, who was the president of the United Coal Miners Union, and called him a bunch of scabs. And so, because they were making trinkets offline. That, that's right. They weren't unionized. <laughs> so, uh, this probably made all of New York p papers. And Henry Ford was popping the buttons off his vest. And so, uh, Henry Ford used to come to chapel every morning, yes. most every morning. Sat up in the choir laugh right. and listened to his favorite hymns that right. the kids sang. And so. Uh, one time he was there and he looked up this young boy who was a trainer and he said, uh, what does your father do? And he said, well, he's a civil engineer, Mr. Ford. He said, well, any man that would teach his son to talk to that guy like that, he said, I'd like to meet him. He said, could he meet me in the herb garden next Tuesday? And he said, well, I'll see. He's, uh, he's on a job down in Ohio this week. And... Uh, but perhaps he could come. Well, he did come. And Henry Ford came down the sidewalk from the chapel to the herb garden and pulled up his sleeve and he said, what color are my veins? And Mr. Apache said, well, they're blue, Mr. Ford. He said, well, mine are too. He says, in fact, he said, I'm entertaining the king and queen of England in the chapel right now. And I think my blood's just as blue as theirs. But he said, could you meet me next week? And he said, I, yes, certainly. So the next he took another day off work. Right. So he went went into his office, and Henry Ford said, "What do you know about bricking uh, blast furnaces?" He said, "I know absolutely nothing." And Henry Ford said, "You're hired. You're the first honest guy I ever met." So Mr. Apache supervised the rebricking of the Ford Rouge steel mill blast furnaces. And as an aside, one of the little girls from the class at that time came home and her mother said, did you hear the king and queen were in town? And she said, <laughs> I went for a ride with them. <laughs> She'd been invited into the carriage as they toured the, the, the village. <laughs> How did you ever get to school with all these stories on the way? Let's go. <laughs> okay. This is one of the uh, schools that Henry Ford went to as a young boy, and he and his friend St uh, St or Edsel Rutterman uh, were seatmates. Uh oh, and troublemakers out there. They were troublemakers. They were getting <laughs> in all sorts of trouble. We already heard the story about the flood at recess. <laughs> no, that was at Miller School. Oh, okay. This this school came from where? This was over in the Scotch Settlement District, over around uh, Joy Road and Greenfield, where the Ford uh, Cemetery is, where Henry and Clara are buried. So your grandma taught in here? Yes, great, great, great grandmother, not my. And my mother went to school before it was moved into the village, and my brother went to school here, and his wife, and uh, it was, you know, has a lot of meaning. So what's it feel like to be a walking history book, sir? <laughs> you know a lot. Well, you know, it was a wonderful experience going to school here. And uh, just there's all kinds of memories that brings back when I come over here. Mm -hmm. You can feel it in the air. There's a certain electricity being right 
within vision of the place where one of the premier people who really made his mark by inventing the assembly line um, made a mark on our community. Right. The genius, that spark of inspiration and creativity within each young lad and lass that went through the Edison Institute. And these houses that are in the village are uh, birthplaces or homes of a lot of these famous people that he really uh, glommed on to, like Luther Burbank or uh, Foster, Foster, Stephen yes. Foster. His favorite anyway. composer, Stephen Foster. Stephen Foster yeah. uh, has a, his home is birthplace is supposedly right here right it was moved here from near Philadelphia and uh, I understood it was Edison who really captured Ford's imagination and he used to have um, glass showcases of every single thing that was part of Edison's estate he's even got his last breath in a <laughs> test tube in the museum <laughs> so that's a little bit fixated <laughs> but one of the other stories we both spoke about the other day was his tithing experience where if he gave 10 percent of anything he believed in a prosperous universe an abundant universe and he did an experiment in the saline area with a wheat field do you remember what they called that they, well that was the dynamic kernel mill and uh -huh. the, the dynamic he started that in 1944 Unfortunately, Henry Ford, Edsel Ford passed away in 1943, and Henry Ford was very devastated, and he was, physically, he was not well at all. But he went along with this project, and they were going to do it, and, and at the end of four years, they were going to have a big celebration at this dynamic kernels mill, which they called it. And, um, do you remember what it was that if they took 10% of the wheat right. and gifted it, right. that it, they believed that it would be much more prosperous and they have a hundredfold return on that right. gift? And and it grew and grew and grew, and they figured if they had gone through to six years, there wouldn't have been enough uh, birth to plant any more wheat up. Enough to grow to feed us all. Right. <laughs> so I think that's a good story to end on. All right. Because it's an inspirational one that tells us, even in this time, there's enough for us all. And if we can think beyond our midget mind into a more creative, inspired time, and maybe use some of the examples of the hemp that was grown and the soybeans that were harvested and the victory gardens that were grown and just the gift that was given in terms of sharing education with youth, that there's hope for us all. Any last words? Well, it's been a real privilege and a lot of fun talking with you today. Thank you for making Showbones as you brought me down memory lane. <laughs> it's been an inspiration. Charlie Davis, I appreciate so much you taking time, and what a dapper bow tie you wear, sir. <laughs> Thanks for joining us for Earth Talk. I'm Ellen Wara. Think about your own life and the seeds that are there, the little memories that might have brought you inspiration as a youth, things you always wanted to do. Take those out and dust them off if you want, and try to inspire those around you by reaching higher for the sky and the light beyond. I'm Ellen Wara. Thanks for watching Earth Talk.